Oh, howdy all, grab yourself a drink, it is time for some Path of Exile discussion. Grunning Gear Games today announced the 2023 November event schedule. And let's start with what's missing. There is no Endless Delve in this time, which I think is something a fair number of people will miss. However, we've got the one popular event that they ran in March returning, the Crangle Passives event, but this is returning in a very new format. In March 2023, it was a forced solo self-found or group self-found event. And it was also something where you were encouraged to just run a certain distance in the game. The new Crangled Passives is going to give you full flexibility to develop your Atlas as much as you can in seven days on a version of the base game that gives you less character power and less capacity to plan characters. Crangle Passives will be a lot of fun. It will be something for people who are looking for an additional challenge. The next event is Blast from the Past. This is going to be an ultra high character power event. We're going to have access to Sentinels and we're going to have access to Calandra mechanics. Now, Calandra mechanics are something a lot of people have been going, oh yeah, who cares, who cares? But it is important to say that they provided some very, very powerful jewelry after they got buffed. Calandra early on was a very low power mechanic, but then after most people quit the league, it started getting more and more powerful. So you started seeing more and more really good items getting pulled out of the RNG version of the Reflecting Mist. And then the Ethereal Reflecting Mist, the one that you submit an item to, people got just a bit better over time at generating that. If you're someone who is motivated by long-term progress in Standard, this is going to be an absolute must play. You'll be able to create amulets in this seven day event that will be more powerful than anything that has ever existed in a temporary league. This is not going to be easy to craft, but it is going to be possible. That's because the combination of sentinels allowing you to get plus one to the level of all skill gems, plus one to the level of a particular class of skill gems, such as plus one to the level of cold skill gems, and also the sentinel exclusive suffix, plus X percent aura effect on the same amulet. You can get these three things together, then you can submit that to the ethereal reflecting mist, and if you get extraordinarily lucky, you can walk away with an item that has plus two to the level of cold skills, plus two to the level of all skill gems, and also has a slightly over double strength sentinel aura effect on it. So this will be an incredibly high power event. Or alternately, if you are not motivated by standard progress like most of the player base, you can still play around with these mechanics that were a lot of fun when they were out. And do remember that Calandra did get better later in the league. I actually think that Calandra, as it existed towards the end of 3.19 was in a fine place, but its reputation had been destroyed by the way that it was in the first two weeks. The third event, Shifting Stones, is something that is completely new, but that I think a lot of people will see some connection to the popular Mayhem and Turmoil events that have run in the past. I don't consider it the same event as Mayhem, but I do consider it to be a spiritual successor of the Mayhem events, with a lot of the same themes, and the same idea of each zone has one existing mechanic dialed up to 11 in it. This is going to probably be something that's going to add a lot of loot and a lot of unpredictability to areas. Also important to note, this is the only one of these events that is voided. This means that your characters that you play in the Shifting Stones events will be deleted on the end of that event. Now there are going to be some prizes for this. You're going to be able to win up to two Ancestor Mystery Boxes if you make level 50 characters in two of the different events. So for instance, if you make two characters that go to level 50 in Crangle Passives, you'll only get one Ancestor Mystery Box. If you make one in Crangle Passives and also one in Blast from the Past, you'll get two. And if you make one in each of the three events, then you're still capped at two because that is the limits of the promotion. I think for most players, you'll look at these events and you'll say, this one looks fun, this one looks mediocre, this one looks bad. You won't necessarily agree with other players on which one is in each category, but that doesn't really matter because it's your personal taste that matters. What you should do is play only the ones that look fun and completely ignore the ones that don't speak to you. Shouldn't really need to say this, but it always comes up every time there's an event with prizes that there are people who play for seven hours in an event they don't like for a prize that is strictly worse than five US dollars, i.e. a mystery box. This is a terrible idea, don't do it. Only play the events that look like they're going to be fun. So with the price structure, if one of them in particular doesn't sing to you, then you definitely don't want to play it. Anyways, let's have a look at some of the details that are here. For those of you that missed the March events, the Crangle Passives event was the only one of these March events that didn't enforce multiplayer at the same time as restricting the pool of players that you could play with. And that was the reason that it was the most popular of them. Now with the Crangle Passives event, there are two main things that take place. Firstly, the passive skill tree is jumbled. What this means is that minor passive tree skills like plus 18 cold resistance that's just south of Scion start will be swapped with something else. Maybe that one gets swapped with a 10 dexterity node. This scrambling will be the same for everyone, but it will not be known in advance of the event. Secondly, the same thing happens with notables on the classic passive tree and with keystones on the classic passive tree. 
So this means that Blood Magic, which is a keystone, may be where Chaos Inoculation usually is because they're both keystones, but it won't be where Constitution usually is because Constitution is a notable rather than a keystone. Essentially, they get swapped around, but they always stay the same size. At the same time as this, exactly the same thing is happening inside Ascendancies. For example, where the Occultist normally gets Profane Bloom, it might instead receive the Tafoa node from the Chieftain. And then the Chieftain in the spot where the Tafoa node normally is, this creates a really interesting dynamic where the first two or so days of the event is going to be completely exploring new territory for everyone. So people who create characters in the first couple of days, essentially their characters are going to be pretty terrible. But then a meta will start to develop. Additionally, there'll be some things you can do in this league that you can't do in the normal game. For example, it might be possible, and I can't guarantee this, to get the new Guardian node that grants elemental relics on the same character as the elementalist Shaper of Flame. And if you can get those two together, then that could be an extremely, extremely powerful combination indeed. That said though, you should expect characters in the Krangle Passives event to be considerably weaker than in the base game. One of the key reasons for this is that all of the Aura Clusters are going to be scattered to the winds. You might find that the Sovereignty node itself is in a particularly good location, but all of the small nodes that make that cluster so incredibly good are going to be scattered off to the winds. Additionally, you might not be able to find a single Aura Mastery node that is any good, that has any good notables in it at all. And so this will mean that your passive tree will be diluted and you will be less powerful than you normally are. Less powerful overall, but you will have some new and unique interactions like the aforementioned possibility of igniting with the Guardian's nodes at the same time. And additionally, there's a couple of other little things that are important to know about this. This is going to be parented to Ancestor Softcore Trade. There is only a Softcore Trade version of this, there is no Hardcore, there is no Solo Self Found, and there's no option to play this with the Ruthless rule set. But also, this is not going to be a Voided event, unlike the March event. What's going to happen is that your character's passive tree is going to decrangle when you are then exported to Ancestor Softcore Trade. Another important note here is that all of these events are taking somewhat of a halfway house between the Softcore rule set and the Hardcore rule set. It is closer to the Softcore rule set than the Hardcore rule set, but there is an element of the Hardcore rule set here, and that is that you lose five times the normal experience upon death. So, if you die while you're in Act 7, you're going to lose a quarter of a level, not 5% of a level. If you die when you're at Deep End Game, instead of losing 10% of a level, you're going to lose 50% of a level. This is going to mean that if you want to reach levels that are genuinely very high, you're probably going to need to build in the way that you would build a hardcore character. And that's going to be very difficult in the context of the Krangle Passives event. Finally, there's a random draw for microtransactions. I just generally advise players to completely ignore that this is here, and if you win something, it's a little bit of a bonus. There will be small prizes that go out to a couple of hundred people that reach level 90, a few dozen that reach 95, and reaching 95 with the 5 times XP penalty is going to be very hard. And there's a number of other prizes that will go out to random players that are selected from probably a pretty big pool that reach levels 60, 70, 80, and 85. I would expect that these events will be quite popular, and as a result, I think you've got a negligible chance of winning any of these particular draws, which is why I'm not going to go into any real detail as to what they are. In short, play the event if the event looks like fun, don't play it just for the prizes. There are also going to be 10 hideout statues that will be awarded. You pretty much need to be a Path of Exile racer and an expert in that field in order to be competitive for these. There's going to be a Legends hideout statue, a Champions hideout statue, a Victor's hideout statue, and Challenger's hideout statues for positions 4 through 10. Okay, so let's jump into the Blast from the Past event and the details of this one next. This is going to be absolutely mandatory if you are in that small section of the player base who are motivated by your progress in Standard because the best amulets that exist in Standard at the end of this event will become the best amulets that exist in the Standard League. It is important to note though that these will be already mirrored and as a result they're not going to be something that will be new mirror tier bases, they will just be an item that you can use. This is going to have the Sentinel mechanics and also the Lake of Calandra mechanics. These are going to coexist in this event. So Blast from the Past gives you a chance to return to an old favourite in the case of Sentinel and an old disappointment that has been improved a lot by the end of it in the case of Calandra. Or if you missed them when they originally came out, then you can experience them for the first time. So in this event, almost every zone is going to have both the Sentinel mechanics and the Calandra mechanics active. For those of you that aren't familiar, Sentinel in a lot of ways was Tormented Spirits done right. You decide when the Tormented Spirit pops out and starts possessing monsters, and there's a whole bunch of different Sentinels that you can get, and these Sentinels are staggeringly rewarding when you kill them. 
Calandra is in a lot of ways a variant of the Temple of Atsuadal. You'll have decisions you can make in every zone that enable you to build up a Lake of Calandra that you can then visit. And when you go to this Lake of Calandra, there's a number of different rooms you can get that are trash, and there's a number of different rooms you can get that are pretty, pretty impressive. The Calandra mechanics have three main types of loot. The first one is that sometimes when you complete a room in the Lake of Calandra, well actually almost always when you complete one, you'll get a chest that will have special loot in it. These are pretty bad up to about difficulty 5, but after that they start containing raw divine orbs at least often enough to matter, and also contain a lot of other good stuff in them. These things add up, but they're the meat and potatoes. The really special things are the reflected jewellery. What reflected jewellery is, is that it is jewellery that has its magnitudes of modifiers scaled up far beyond normal limits, but they can also be scaled by a negative factor. For example, if a ring rolls 35 chaos resistance, you could instead get 102 chaos resistance or negative 102 chaos resistance. And that would be what you would expect to get if this was coming from a difficulty 12 tile within Lake of Calandra and it was the RNG Reflecting Mist. The RNG version of the Reflecting Mist has a larger scaling factor, but you have no agency over what the base item is. And in my experience, 95 to 98% of the time, the RNG Reflecting Mist gives you something terrible, but that other 2 to 5%, it can be really, really good. Which, those of you that are familiar with uber bossing will be very familiar with how sometimes you can fight a boss and 2% of the time it drops something really good, the other 98% of the time you lose currency on it. It was definitely my experience in the Calandra League that I got 3 items that were 10 divine orbs or more from this RNG reflecting mist, and one of them I undersold. One of them I sold for a mirror shard when I should have probably asked 4 or 5 for it, so that was my bad. I ended up getting a lot less than I should have out of my jackpot, and there were plenty of these jackpot items going around in the league. That said, you probably won't get one on any given entrance into the Lake of Calandra. The second type is the much rarer Ethereal Reflecting Mist. Here, the magnitude of the modifiers is a little bit lower, but it's much more powerful because you can submit your own jewellery to it. For example, you can roll an item that has plus one to the level of all skill gems, plus one to the level of all physical skill gems, and also the Sentinel exclusive mod that grants increased aura effect on your amulet. And because you'll have access to jewellery recombinators, you won't need to mess around with metamod constrained harvest in order to get your plus two amulet to start with. Instead, you'll be able to do that just by using sentinels, which is a lot cheaper and a lot more reliable. You can then submit this into the ethereal reflecting mist, and depending on how lucky you get, you'll find that one, two, or if you're extremely lucky, all three of these will end up having their modifier magnitudes more than doubled and also remain positive. This is potentially an incredibly powerful effect, and it's never been possible to experience both the Sentinel crafting and the Lake of Calandra together, so this means that this will eclipse the best jewellery that exists in Standard. As for the mechanics themselves, Sentinel is something that really plays well if you just like huge explosions of tough monsters that then shower a lot of loot, and the Calandra mechanics feel more like mini-bosses, really amped up mini-bosses. The Lake of Calandra, in a lot of ways, feels like 100% delirious content. So if you like that, you might like the Lake of Calandra content. And whether you like that or not, you'll probably like the Sentinel mechanic. It was definitely one of the most popular ones that Grinding Gear Games have ever put out. So that is the Blast from the Past event. This is probably going to be the highest power of the three events, and it's something that I think a lot of people will have some fun with, although it won't speak to people who like playing weird and wonderful off-meta builds as much as the Krangle Passives event does. One last thing with the Blast from the Past event, there will likely be a group of streamers that will try to set a record for the fastest level 100 that's ever happened. Not the fastest league start to level 100, but the fastest alternate character to level 100 that's ever been done. That's because the Calandra mechanics were incredibly, incredibly broken for leveling an alternate character if you had a lot of currency to throw at it, considerably better even than Legion 5 ways, and the Sentinel mechanics probably amp that up as well, although because the two have never been able to be used together, we don't know how that's going to play out. If it is the case that these two XP effects multiply, then this is going to be absolutely ridiculous. But even if they don't multiply, even if they just add together, we'll probably see a new record for the fastest alternate character from level 0 to level 100. And the people that do this will probably end up buying every Lake of Calandra that has an untainted paradise tile on it that they can get their hands on. Finally, this event is again in this medium core environment that is closer to soft core than it is to hardcore, but that does have this nastier than usual sting of dying in it. 
And I think for a lot of players, this is just going to mean that you will want to avoid running super, super rippy Lakes of Calandra until you have just dinged a level. You can just store those things. Sentinels are a little bit more safe because you can set them off in really controlled environments. Finally, we have the Shifting Stones event. Now, fair warning, before we go into this, you do need to know that this is going to be a void event. This means that your characters will not remain playable after the event ends. These characters will not move to Standard, they will not move to Ancestor, they will effectively be deleted. They'll be able to keep them as a trophy, but that will be it. The way that this is going to work is that it will be a spiritual successor to the Mayhem events Grinding Gear games have run before, but with a theme that is based upon the various Atlas Keystones that were added in patch 3.22. So, in each zone that you go into, there will be one of the following combinations of mods applied. Either Speaker of the Dead Keystone, which is the one that allows Tormented Spirits to possess you and for you to then touch enemies with them, and 10 Tormented Spirits. This is the jackpot one. This is the really, really powerful mechanic. It takes a bit of getting used to, but this ghost busting strategy has been extremely powerful. And this is basically Speaker of the Dead Keystone plus a Winged Torment Scarab on every map that you open that has this effect in play. Next, there is Blight with the Cassia's Pride Keystone, which is the one that turns Blight Encounters into a tower defense game. Next, there is Legion plus the Timeless Conflict Keystone. This is the one that transforms the way Legion works, so you're under no time pressure, but you are capped on the amount that you can break out of the Legion. Then there is Delirium plus Unending Nightmare, where the Unending Nightmare Keystone is the one that turns off the timer for Delirium, but also turns off the ability to get Delirium mobs and Simulacrum Splinters. And then we have Beyond and Endless Tide Keystone as the last option. Endless Tide being the one that totally transforms the way Beyond works, turns off Beyond bosses, and instead amps up the amount of Tainted Currency that you can get, and amps up the amount of XP that you can get out of Beyond. Every 15 minutes, the mods that areas have will change. So for instance, if you discover at 32 past 6 that Tormented Spirits are in the Atoll map, then every Atoll map that you open until 6.45 will have Tormented Spirits in it, after which it's going to then rotate out to something else. Now, this is going to, again, be based upon the Standard League, which means no access to Trials of the Ancestors, and is also going to be a voided event. It's also going to have this 5 times XP penalty as well. I would suggest this event if you are someone who likes having wild numbers of monsters in every maps and to have wild and unpredictable events, then you'll find that this is something that could be a lot of fun. And I would suggest against playing in this event if you're someone that's concerned with continuity of character power. If you're the sort of person who likes playing a character for a while in a league, then occasionally logging back into it in standard, then you definitely don't want to play this event because you won't have that option. Ultimately, I don't think this event necessarily needs to be a voided event. Grinding Gear Games have clearly done that because the Tormented Spirits effect is very, very, very strong. But I don't know that a weak event is going to be long enough to have a huge impact on the amount of items in Standard, especially if they've decided that allowing new items to be created with Recombinators, and additionally allowing items that have been produced with Recombinators to be submitted to the Ethereal Reflecting Mist, something that's never been possible before, that if they think that that's fine, then I think it would also be fine to have an additional large-ish number, potentially, of Apothecary cards enter Standard from the Shifting Stones event. Anyways, they've made their decision. It's not the one I would have made, but it is the one that's been made. It's probably going to require a pretty powerful character because getting 10 Tormented Spirits in dangerous areas is going to be incredibly, incredibly rippy. And you're going to have to deal with that a lot while you are leveling through the campaign as well. Anyways, the next thing we've got is an events FAQ. Let's go through all of that. Firstly, will these events be PC exclusive like most of the events? And the answer is no. Note you'll be able to run these on console as well. Second question is, are there hardcore versions of these events? And the answer is no. Interestingly, they don't have any questions about Solo Cell Found, which I thought there would be, but it looks like they're making these softcore, trade enabled, without the Ruthless rule set on for all three of them. Can I play my existing character? No, you'll need to make a new character in each event. And I think for most people, this is going to be a reason not to play all three of these events, but instead pick one or two of them that look like fun, because people generally find they'll burn out on the campaign if they're running it three times in a small period of time. And then of course, when 3.23 comes out, you want to do the same thing again. How do I join the event? It's slightly different to the way that you join a normal challenge league. A character selection screen, there'll be a panel below your characters that lists the events available. There's also the same interface for those of you that are playing in private leagues. You can then join the event by clicking join. The option becomes available 30 minutes before the event is set to begin, and your character can't move until the event starts. Can I make private leagues that are parented to these events? No, you cannot. 
Can I change my ascendancy class during these events? The answer is yes, and for people who are curious as to why this has been asked, there's been a number of events in the past that Grinding Gear Games have run where there's been a race that's been aimed at sort of top 1% players, and because of the integrity of that race, they've had to turn off ascendancy class swaps. And that's something that because they're running a different type of race here, they don't need to do. If I delete my character, what's going to happen to my prizes? Your prizes will go to the void with your character that's been deleted, so don't delete your characters until after prizes have been awarded. What Grinding Gear Games normally do here is they will announce on the website formerly known as Twitter when it is safe to delete your characters. If I level multiple characters, we'll have a greater chance of winning a prize. Now, Grinding Gear Games give the technically correct answer of yes, but I will also say the answer is going to be it is not worth it. That's the answer you really want to know here. Can I win more than one microtransaction prize? Yes you can, but almost certainly no you won't because there's going to be a lot of people who play these events and there'll be a fairly large number of people who will get to very high levels in them. So there will be some individuals that get lucky and win more than one microtransaction prize, but they probably won't include you. Additionally, you will be able to get exactly two of the Ancestor Mystery Boxes, but whether you consider a Mystery Box to be a real prize or not is entirely up to you to decide. I would say probably not. When will I receive a prize? The Ancestor Mystery Boxes, the instant you hit level 50. Other ones will be after the end of the event and you'll receive a private message on the Grinding Gear Games official website to notify you if you do win any of these. And again, there will be an announcement made on the website formerly known as Twitter. The Trial of the Ancestors is only going to be available in the Crangled Passives event because the other two are parented to Standard in some way. One to Standard Proper and one to the Standard Void League. What happens if I already have all the microtransactions in the Ancestor Mystery Box? Well, you've probably spent more on Ancestor Mystery Boxes than you should have. However, you'll get two Apollyon Mystery Boxes instead. And how are the randomly drawn microtransaction prize pools shared across platforms? Essentially, players who reach a certain level threshold on PlayStation will be treated the same as if they were a PC player for this. Anyways, that's all the information that's available so far on the November 2023 events. There is going to be a lot of time for discussion of the best builds to run in them, and also Atlas strategies, all sorts of things like that. I think the most popular of these events will be the Blast from the Past with Sentinels and Calandra, and I do think that builds that excel at the use of Pandemonium Sentinels will be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly good in that event. Anyways, I'm going to leave it there. May your passives be crangled in interesting ways.